To what extent do persuasive technologies already affect human well-being in the attention economy? Let's stick with the idea of, of fake news um, in social media, for example, conspiracy theories, ideas that are pretty unreasonable, like the world is flat, that you can kill coronavirus virus with a hairdryer, or that uh, coronavirus created 5G mobile technology, or was it the other way around? Uh, in any case, uh, conspiracy theories are, are, are very prevalent nowadays. And let's go, for example, to YouTube, a Google company. So YouTube has been extremely aware about the problem of conspiracy theories, uh, really outrageous fake news, right? Provenly wrong uh, ideas. And traditionally in, in 2018, that's what this graph here shows, Fake news, if you're locked out of your account, that's not even controlling for all the personalization that they know how to actually really hit you. Uh, so if you're locked out of the account, traditionally, uh, the raw frequency was around up to 10%. 7, 8, 9, 10% of the videos that were recommended by YouTube's recommender engine. By the way, do you know what the uh, name is of this persuasive technology? The YouTube recommender engine, which drives 70% of YouTube's views, is called the watch time optimization algorithm. Try to figure out what this algorithm is programmed to do. <laughs> Keeping your attention, literally, that's the name of that, of that machine. So, Google became really aware of that and then in the mid-2019 tried to really tune it down. And they achieved to uh, have about, let's say, 5% to make the numbers round, 5% of the recommendations, only 5% of the recommendations to be outrageous conspiracy theories. So how massive is the extent already? Well, the average YouTube user, you and me included, watch 40 minutes per day of YouTube, 70%, as I said, coming from this artificial intelligence called the watch time optimization algorithm. That means uh, the average YouTube user, user watches half an hour a day content that's recommended by a persuasive technology. 5% uh, of that is about a minute and a half a day. That means 25%, one in four people on planet Earth, watches one and a half minute of conspiracy theories a day. That's the extent, 5% like sounds like a small number, but that's the extent what it actually gets to. Now, 25%, 2 billion people, uh, that's a lot of people. If, if, if you compare it with other uh, groups, for example, there are 1.8 billion Muslims on planet Earth and 2.2 billion Christians. Now, I don't know if the follow, each follower of these faiths spends a minute and a half, for example, praying a day or practicing their faith, but I know that on average the same amount of people spends a minute and a half per day on average watching conspiracy theories promoted by an artificial intelligence program to optimize your watching time. Phenomena is pretty massive. Now, in general, we spend a lot of time on social media. Uh, in Europe and uh, in North America, about two hours a day, people are connected to social media. That doesn't mean they write two hours a day, but they're interacting with social media uh, on and off for about two hours a day. In Latin America, that's the leader, three and a half hours a day. Now, even if you don't actively interact with social media, I mean, what you put in social media and what you do there, that's just like the cream on the top of the cake. The cake is every digital step you take. So in the words of Facebook, the world's largest social network, when you visit a site or app that uses our services, we receive information even if you're logged out if you don't have a Facebook account. That means even if you don't have a Facebook account, Facebook has an account about you, because all other services using Facebook. So if you go into your email right now and put in the search bar Facebook, you will see a lot of emails that come up in your email account that are not from Facebook. They are using Facebook's services. For example, like us on Facebook. Of course, that button is not for free somehow in the attention economy. That button is connected. And therefore, even if you don't have a Facebook account, you know, they have an account uh, on you. So basically, you attract and they know you to a big extent. What I did here is I opened four newspaper windows 
And then I use this browser extension to see what's actually happening in the background as soon as I go to this to the newspaper. So here are my four newspapers. I open them up. And these, what you can see here, these triangles are all the trackers. So you see immediately over 60 trackers basically docked on. And that was with my ad blocker. Right now I'm turning off my ad blocker. <laughs> so 60 went through the ad blocker, right? And now you can see very quickly in a, in a couple of, in a, in a, in a few minutes, actually, the trackers behind behind the scenes that basically track what I'm doing on these four newspaper pages goes up to 300 uh, in a very quick time. What are these? Well, there are some from Google, some from Facebook, Google Ads, for example, Secure US World. Um, I'm not sure what that's about. Amazon is another. So these trackers basically track every digital step we take, even with our ad blocker turned on. And with that, they know us better than actually we do often ourselves. Now, if I have a lot of information, also, for example, your Facebook likes, I can do a lot of things. You might have heard about this famous experiment here, where they showed that with 10 Facebook likes of yours, the algorithm can predict your personality better than your coworker, right? With 200 better than your spouse, your partner, or, or your parents. and then uh, with a few more, 250, 300, they can predict your personality better than you can yourself. And it's, you don't even need those Facebook likes, which is active social media content. The digital footprint is collected passively with every digital step you take. So if I just know the pattern with which you use your mouse, for example, or which you open and close the windows and the apps on your mobile phone just with this temporal activity without really caring too much about the content, can predict your personality, the algorithm can predict your personality with up to 80%, right? So, so this is just the behavioral pattern that th this digital footprint you have to leave behind, right? Now, if you have some more media rich data, I can actually go deeper. Uh, for example, if you have five images of your face uh, on Facebook, the algorithm maybe can predict your sexual orientation. Now, we always knew people can do that. For example, a human can look somebody in the face and a little bit better than 50-50 predict if you're homosexual or heterosexual. Now, uh, the baseline would be 50-50, right? So for a woman, it's 54%. For men, it's 61% that people could do that because some some people want to be known to be homosexual, for example, and then you, you have a better idea that gives it away, that gives a little bit the edge, but we don't know how we did it. Now, uh, the artificial intelligence, guess how high it gets? Yeah, up to 90%. So if you have five pictures of your face on Facebook, artificial intelligence can predict your sexual orientation with up to 90%. So how does it do it? What a scandal, right? So how did it do it? Well, it basically detected some parts of our face that are collected to the hormonal balance uh, in our body. So for example, if a person does a hormone therapy to change sex, uh, to, to go, for example, from man to woman, these are the little details that change in the face after 13 months, in this case, of taking hormones. And that's what the artificial intelligence basically talks about. Oh, no. This information processor couldn't do that, but artificial intelligence can, with the big data, can actually get so deep. Now, let me be clear: this is a bomb. This is this is. Uh, we live in a world where there are still ten countries on planet Earth that have the death penalty penalty for homosexuality. So, as an academic, we have to point out that these bombs exist. Now, it's for society and governments to regulate. So, summing up, the extent of persuasive technology in the attention economy is, is omnipresent. The technological paradigm uh, has advanced far enough that we now, most of the people in general, understand the downsides of these digital mind extensions, uh, that their business model is programmed to change our behavior, and it, somehow it feels like, well, it, it, it might be it might be too much. And we have to think about, well, how do we get out of it? What are some of the exit strategies?